This is Keeping the Faith on the Mormon Faircast. The Keeping the Faith series explores ways in which our faith can be challenged and ways in which we can overcome those challenges. So let me back up to um, you know the doctrinal issues that uh, you were you were struggling with for some period, you know, and you read um, Rough Stone Rolling, and you say you read you know finding other negative information about the church. Mm-hmm. Um, did you find any positive information or responses? Um, you know, did you find Fair Mormon's website? And um, if so, um, how did that affect you? Um, during that phase. I wasn't searching for something like that. Later on, I was. Uh, so during that phase, I still, I still wasn't. I just kind of put put it on the shelf because Mormonism wasn't true. So therefore, why dive into don't, that don't stuff? Don't need anyway? to worry about researching it anymore. Yeah. Okay. Um, but later down the road, once I, and and maybe we'll get to this in in a second. But once I kind of started to have a rekindling of my faith, then I went through this process of. Okay, how do I reconcile with these issues that I've come across? And and I started searching for for answers on online. Um, I know that I I went to fairmormon.org um, and read articles as well as other people's blogs and articles as well as talks that the that uh, that that have been given and different resources like so, that. So let's, let's talk about what brought you up to that point. You're, you're in Seattle. You are associating with a lot of people who are um, not members of the church, and then I guess even some that are. Yeah. Um, uh, but they don't, I guess, maybe know the extent of, of your disaffection with the church. Yeah. Um, and then what happens? So I, um, <clears throat> I found, I actually met a non-member girl, uh, non-LDS girl who had grown up uh in a in a christian home but wasn't practicing she and and i i i don't i don't quite remember if she believed in god or not at the time but she she wasn't much of a believer um but great girl and we really hit it off and so we start dating and um and just you know it was it was great it was it was the first relationship that i had had with someone outside of the LDS faith. And so, and so it was, it was in some ways a little bit, um, it was, it it, it was, it was a relief because I could discuss. So previously I've dated all these LDS girls who I'm hoping maybe they have had the same doubts I have. I don't find that. And so these, these relationships end. And now I've found someone who has grown up hearing all these crazy stories about Mormons. And so, we're able to talk about them and 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 so it was it was great for a time right and we have great discussions um, at the time the show Big Love was very popular on TV and I had actually never seen an episode I'd heard about it I knew about it but I wasn't much of a TV watcher in general and so I'd never seen an episode and I honestly wasn't aware of how popular it was around the country well I start dating this girl and I find out that it's her and her friends favorite show they love it and they, they watch it religiously. They talk about it. And, um, and so I sit down and I start and I, and I watch an episode or two with her. And I was immediately, I was immediately um, taken back at the kind of tone of the show. If you grew up LDS, you know right away that they've got it wrong, right? Like they're, they're portraying an, a typical LDS family, although, I mean, it's a polygamous, so maybe it's not typical in any respects, I guess, but, but they're trying to portray what Mormonism is like, but they're absolutely missing the mark. And so that part of me that's saying, okay, I don't believe the church is true, but you're, you are characterizing the, the members of the church in this way, and you've got it wrong. And so I start, so we start having this discussion, my girlfriend and myself and, and saying, I'm like, we start talking about it. I'm like, and she's like, so what's, what's true? What's not? And I'm saying, oh, well, they totally got this wrong and they got this right. And, you know, this is, that's just weird the way they did that. That's not how it is. And, 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 I, and I'm explaining all this. And then, and then we start diving into deeper questions about, she starts, you know, throwing out all these, these myths she's heard about Mormonism that are funny and that I'm able to dispel. Like she says, 
the one that, that, that comes to mind was, and, and she had grown up with a few LDS members in, in her high school who she had a, who she had a, um, a positive, um, a positive opinion of. She thought they were really nice people, right? But uh, didn't know much about Mormonism. And so the, the one that comes to mind was she was saying, um, she heard, if I, if I remember right, on a school bus, someone told her that, do you, do you know that Mormons believe that the, the gold angel that's on top of the temple, because they have a temple in, in Seattle, do you know that they believe at the end of the world or the second coming or something, that angel is going to hop off and run east. And I was like, what? Yeah, that's a new one. I haven't heard that. I had never heard it. I had never heard it. And I was just, and, 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 I, and I started laughing. I was like, that's, that's funny. That's, that's hilarious. I've never heard that. No, that's not true, <laughs> right? This is what we believe about the angel Moroni. This is why he's on the temple and et cetera. And so we start going through these, I start dispelling myths and, um, and, and, and so this, this is part of our relationship. And it's part of, and it really started from the beginning because of big love and because of my background, right? And because I'm dealing with, um, oh, well, I'm, I'm leaving or I've left Mormonism, but I just haven't told my family, right? And I'm here in Seattle and, I, and because I wanted to escape Mormonism to some extent. And so, and so we're, we're dating and, um, and she, had a, she had a kid. And so um, we... We talk about, um, you know, how do you raise kids? How would you raise kids? Um, um, and so I, we start, I start thinking about all these different things. And, and uh, as I explain in my, in my piece that I wrote, um, as I'm talking about these subjects, specifically as I am, am talking about, and she's just really inquisitive about, Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon and all these things. And I'm explaining for the first time. I'm really explaining that when I, I haven't, I haven't gone through this process for a long time, explaining to someone in depth. And I start to, I start to feel the spirit at certain points. I start to, I start to feel it's, it's like it's re-triggering something inside of me. Yeah. You're t- teaching in the first discussion. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm not teaching her with, with the intent to convert her. Right. But, instead of converting her, I start converting myself and I start to feel, I start to, and it's interesting. I've, I've heard people talk about this before. I mean, I served a mission and I taught the first discussion a lot and, and you see your investigators go through this process. But for the first time I'm experiencing it where I'm starting to feel for the first time in a long time, these feelings again, I'm starting to feel the spirit come back and start to testify of these things. And that was like, for the first time, it kind of hit me. And then, and then I'm prompted to start making changes, right? Like what you're doing isn't right. And you need to, and in hindsight, I was, it wasn't like the spirit wasn't trying to talk to me before that. But as they talk about in, in the scriptures where people become past feeling, I had pushed the spirit out of my life so much that the spirit would try to talk to me and I just was unwilling to listen to it. And I would be prompted at times to do things, but I would dismiss it immediately. I'd push it out as just a thought, as a fleeting thought, right? What kind of things? Like, you know, uh, like you should start reading your scriptures. (laughs) You should, um, you should, you should start going to church all the time instead of just going to maybe meet a girl, (laughs) right? Or, you know, small things, small impressions or what you're doing isn't right. The, the path you're going down isn't right, but I would immediately dismiss them. I wouldn't even allow them to, to stay for any time. And, and I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't think they came from the spirit. I thought they were just coming from me. But now as I'm talking about these things, I'm, I'm feeling the spirit and I can't deny it. And I'm feeling prompted. And so it caused, as I start to talk to my girlfriend about this and how I feel guilty for, for, um, for what I'm doing and that I need to make changes, um, it starts to cause a rift between us, right? And, uh, 
You, you were, so you started to make changes at that point. Well, I express a desire to. What I kind guess. of changes were you telling her that you were wanting to make? That that I need to um, that I need to start going back to church. If I'm if I'm remembering right, it's been man, it's been a, it's been a it's been a number of years. But um, I one of the things I talk about in my story that I wrote was even when I had decided the church wasn't true, I could never deny completely that the Book of Mormon was true. I could I could never make the claim that it was false. There was something about the Book of Mormon that I had experienced in my life. I felt this connection and this bond to the Book of Mormon that I had had in my life. And even when I thought the church wasn't true and I wasn't and I and I didn't think I'd ever come back, I could not even though I had read and heard, you know, the things that people say about the Book of Mormon and the translation of the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith and how it's all a farce and yada yada yada. I've heard them all and read them all. Um, and yet I could not deny. And so I felt one of the things I felt compelled to do was to start reading the book of Mormon again. And I, and I invited my girlfriend to read it as well. And I gave her a book of Mormon and I said, uh, and I don't remember exactly what I said, but I, I gave her a copy and, and I said, uh, I think I said something along the lines of, you know, like you think you know about the church, but I mean, you don't have to believe in the Book of Mormon, but you should at least read it. I mean, just read it. You don't have to believe it, but it's it's a book. You read, she was, you know, well, well read, loved to read. So I was trying to convince her to just read it, to understand it. And, uh, and so those were, those were some of the things that... And she wouldn't do it. She wouldn't do it. She, she didn't have a desire uh, to, to, to read it or come to church. I, I tried to get her to come to church with me just even once and she wouldn't come. She just so, so you actually did go to church now and then, I guess earlier because you're trying to pick up on girls. Yeah. Uh, and did the bishop uh, reach out to you? Did you get a calling? What, I mean, how did that work? I, uh, again, I was very... Just dodgy and you know, yeah. kind of, you know, yeah. hey, I mean, I, I'm working, I can't do this. Yeah, and I know that we can probably all pinpoint people that we know who are doing this currently, who are a little bit like, they're there, but they're not there, right? And you don't know why, and you're maybe afraid to ask, you're, fit, you're afraid to probe. I was one of those guys. I'd come every once in a while. I'd ward hop, as they call it, you know, to find different girls. I mean, really, my primary motive of going to church during that time was to possibly find, to find a girl, to meet, to meet someone that I could marry. And, and, uh, and so I went from time to time. I did have a calling. I'm, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I did. I did have a calling. And I would, I would go when I was needed, but then I, what was the calling? I think I was a Sunday school teacher. And, um, and so I would give a lesson from, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't often, but occasionally, but I would, I, I did that so I could continue to go to church to try to meet a girl. Right. And so, um, the bishop, the bishop never really, um, I never really I, I definitely didn't tell him what I was thinking. I didn't tell him what I was thinking. How would you have reacted if the bishop would have just confronted you and said, you know, I, I, it seems like you're kind of floating in and out here. Um, yeah. You know, I, I sense that you're not really committed and I'm not really fully invested, right? Yeah. And, and asked you, what, what's going on? Can you, can you share with me your thoughts about the church and how you're feeling about your commitment? Again, I guess hop to a different ward, maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I mean, I was good at dodging. Well, and maybe it depends upon, like you were saying before, the extent to which you felt that it was motivated by love for you. Right, and and I and my bishop at the time, I thought was a great a great person, and I didn't I didn't have a great a strong relationship with him because I wasn't always there, and I didn't really, and I was good at dodging activities and church in general. I I would use work a lot to say can't come to church. I got to go into work. And, uh, and, and so I was good at dodging. So I didn't have a, a an incredibly strong relationship with the bishop as good a relationship as I allowed him to have. Right. But, um, and so I'm sure that if he would have confronted me, I wouldn't have been offended necessarily. I probably would have, um, I, I would have been like, Oh shoot. Like I've been caught to some degree. I've been caught in my lie where I'm just trying to be here to go through the motions to benefit for my own gain. 
and maybe I would have just gone to another ward. Like you said, I don't know for sure, but that's a possibility. Mm. Yeah. So um, this relationship with this girl um, starts to fall apart. Yeah. And, and so what happens then? So basically, I come to the conclusion that I can't continue. I can't. I can't continue to uh, live the way I'm living, and I've got to make changes. And at this point, I'm still not. It's not like I'm fully back in, you know, believing and going to church all the time and reading my scriptures. And I haven't, I haven't confessed my past transgressions to my bishop. I'm not temple worthy by any means. Um, uh, but I feel the desire to start to make that change. And, and essentially my girlfriend and myself come to the conclusion that this probably isn't going to work. We're going to have to go different ways. And it was, it was, you know, it, it ended, it ended as well as it could have. We remained friends and kind of like this, this is sad that we can't reconcile our differences because we have a great relationship, but she doesn't want to go to church. She's not a religious person. That's not up her alley. And I'm wanting to start to figure out my belief in God again and read the Book of Mormon and go to church and go down that path again. I still, I'm still not fully converted again, right? But I'm starting that process. So so that happens shortly after I decide that I want to quit my job and I quit my job. It was kind of like a, it kind of happened quickly. And did I have anything to do with your relationship with the church? I mean, were you considering here, I want to get, get back to Utah or was it completely unrelated? No, they were unrelated. I wasn't, um, my job, they were semi-related, I guess. Yeah. If I'm thinking back, I did, I did. So I have a desire to go back to Utah to be closer to my family and to surround myself with good people and people that I look up to and people that I respect. And, and, and I should go back and say that I think I sat down and I made this list and I said, okay, I want to go back and catalog the times in my life where I was the happiest. And I tried to look at it from like a, research perspective and I started to I, I went back to as far as I could remember my first memories and I start to go through my experiences through my age and I'm writing down these experiences these times in my life and then I made another column and I said what what was I doing at that time was I active was I not you know what was I feeling and I came to the conclusion pretty pretty quickly it was pretty clear as I looked through it that that I was happiest when I was actively trying to pursue living the gospel to its fullest, living, living the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and, um, and that, and that this, and that doing the opposite wasn't bringing me happiness. And so then I started to say, well, who are the people that I, of all the people that I know in my life, who are the people that I respect the most that I want to be most like, I made a list of those people too. And, and, and so with that, I decided that um, I wanted to surround myself with those people again. I wanted to be around them, and most of them were here in, in, in Utah. And, and I wanted to be around these good people, and I wanted, to, I wanted them in my life, and I wanted to emulate what they were doing, and I wanted to, I wanted to explore again the possibility that the church was true. I, I wasn't certain yet, but I... I had, a, I had a hope, which I think is where everybody starts, right? So I decided, yeah, I think I want to move back to Utah. And then I wasn't completely happy with my job, and I decided to quit. And so then that, coupled with this, I decided to move back to Utah. And so then I came back to Utah. So I guess what happened is you started to feel kind of, I don't know, maybe spiritual yearning. You yeah. know, as you're talking about Joseph Smith and you're talking about the Book of Mormon and you're, you're telling your, your girlfriend, you know, you ought to read the Book of Mormon and you're, you're kind of being reminded about how you felt. Yeah. And, you know, then you're remembering about how it's affected people's lives. You're, you're remembering the good fruit that comes from the gospel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and you want that fruit back in your life, I guess. Yes. Is that, is that, have I summarized that? Correctly, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and so now you move back to Utah, and and then what happens? I move back to Utah, and uh, I'm not. I'm still. 
I'm still not uh, completely fully back to believing, I guess you could say, to, to knowing if I, if I, to know the church is true and to want to be it. But what, I have, I have, I have the desire. A, a desire to know or a desire to, what, what, how would you describe the desire? What kind of desire did you have? I wanted to, so we talked about before when I, about the age of 14, I start to really feel the spirit in my life. And for anyone who's been there, there is nothing like it. The, the, the overwhelming joy and peace and comfort and happiness that comes from living and immersing yourself in the gospel. Not, not doing it halfway or 75% but all the way you're in you're all in you're not riding the fence you are you are going to church and looking for ways to serve and looking to participate you're not you're not just there to go through the motions and when i was doing that in my life there was no other happiness i had experienced similar to that happiness and i wanted it back and so i desired to have that in my life again and it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that there that there aren't challenges when when you're going when you're experiencing that you still you still have challenges, but the gospel and the principles of the gospel bring a peace and a comfort and a foundation that allow you to overcome those things better, right? And so I I yearned for that again, and so I came back and I started. I said, okay. I kind of looked at it from an investigator perspective as a missionary. If I'm going to investigate this again, I've got to commit and try again. I uh, and so and so I resolved to read my scriptures every day sincerely and sincerely try to understand them and know if they were true and then pray about them. I resolved to pray and and sincerely pray and, and look for answers. I resolved to go to church and serve and actively participate and do all the things that I knew I needed to do because those are all the Sunday school answers, right? Those are all the things that we always say that we always know, that everybody knows. But I knew from experience, or at least I had been told or I had said over the years, these things are very important. And so I knew that putting them back in place was the first step. So that was the first step I did. And I started down that process. And as I began going down that process, the spirit and the light started to, started to come back slowly right it started to come back into my life and i think i mentioned it in my in my in my in my uh, blog i wrote until that point i don't think i had realized how much it had left or that it was there to begin with because i had grown up in it i had been surrounded by it i'd been like immersed a, a in fish it. in the water that you know yeah. you, you don't recognize that you're all wet until you you know you jump out of the water and exactly you know what you're missing exactly and so for the first time i i it dawned on me, it was like this light bulb moment of, oh my goodness, I have, I have lost all of this light that I once had. And, it's, and so it started to come back in. It started to slowly come back in. And as it comes back in, I mean, it doesn't mean that it's easy, right? There's still, there's still trials. There's still temptation. You're still pulled to go back the other way that, that, that you were. So I don't, I don't want to try and say that it was a piece of cake because it wasn't, but I felt myself very driven to overcome those, those things. And, and as, as more light comes in, I wanted more. I sought more. I, I desired to get back to that point and to feel that joy that I had once felt and, and the light in the spirit. What role did family and friends play in this process, if any? Um, again, my cousin... Um, my cousin who knew, he, he's, he's really the only uh, family member who knew about the experience from beginning to end because he, he was aware of it. And I, I moved back in with him when I moved back to Utah. So, um, so he was a support, absolutely. He, he, and he always was. He was always encouraging me to um, do what, what, what I was supposed to. And yet, um, he was smart enough to understand that I had to make the decision myself. So he never tried to force me or push me or put pressure on me to do so. And, and I think, I think that was important, but, but he was always there to support me. So he definitely was, was a help. 
besides him, as far as family members, nobody else knew. And um, at least within my family. Although, again, like I said, I think there were friends and family who perceived on on a certain level that I that I was straying, but that no, none of them knew the full extent, except for except for this one cousin. So, um, <clears throat> so really, um, really, he was the only one that knew about it at the time. But having said that, my family. My family is loving and supportive by default. And so that never left. And when I came back, that was there again, right? And so just being able to be around them and to be around my, my family and my siblings um, who loved me and loved me unconditionally was, was a great strength. Even though they didn't know it at the time, they were, they were helping me. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I guess what happens is you start becoming active again yeah you're reading you're attending church um you're praying yeah and what's the next step uh the next step was a hard step because um i think i think i think a lot of people go through this i started to think in my mind is there a way for me to come back completely without having to go through the repentance process (laughs) Can I avoid the pain slash discomfort slash um, um, I'm thinking embarrassment of, embarrassment that's the word I was I, it was in Russian for some reason um, <laughs> embarrassment that comes with that I was searching for a way to do that and ultimately obviously I I resolved that there was no way I, I had to go through the full repentance process which included um, meeting with my bishop and, and, and going through that process. And so I started that process and, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to, I pushed it off for a while, but, um, but that was the next step for me. And how did that go? It went well, um, as I mean, um, you know, bishops are, I've had a million bishops in my life and they've all been, they're all different. They all come from different backgrounds and they all have different personalities, but every single one of them is supportive and loving and trying to do their best, right? And so my bishop was no exception. He, he, um, he, he helped me through the process. He, he listened to me. He counseled with me. He gave me the steps that I needed to complete to help me um, understand the atonement and apply the atonement in my life. And so I started to go through that process and I was, I was, I guess you could say a little bit disheartened when I found out that I would have to go through a disciplinary council to completely, um, come back. And I was afraid (laughs) because I'd never been through one. Um, I'd sat through some ironically, not, not ironically, but incidentally on my mission, was the only time I think I'd ever sat in them because I was translating for my mission president who was the presiding authority over these meetings. But that was the only experience I'd ever had with them. And so, and so you know, you, you hear a lot about these experiences, but never really from the church, always from outside experiences. And so this was my first experience with it. And I was, I was, um, I was nervous and I didn't want to go through it, but I did. And um, this is a disciplinary council before the high council with the stake president. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, the stake president wasn't there, but the, the high council, if I remember right, the high council and the bishopric were uh, the, the full fight, full high council or just a high counselor, uh, not the full high council, um, a high counselor, maybe multiple. I don't remember exactly. And, and the bishopric. Okay. For sure. Okay. So this was, this was a, a disciplinary council conducted by the bishopric. Yeah, under the direction of the stake president, who okay. was aware of it. Yeah. All right. So, so he was. So, so the stake president. I mean, I don't know exactly how the policy works, but he had counseled with the stake presidents uh, on this matter, and the stake president advised him to that he could do it this way. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if you have if you have a Melchizedek priesthood holder, and you know, it's likely that excommunication is going to be necessary, then um, that's something you'd handle at the stake level with the yeah. stake president and the high council. It sounds like they felt like in your case that uh, it wasn't serious enough that they were 
you know, confident that there was going to have to be excommunication. Yeah. Um, and so I, I guess what, what was the result of, of the disciplinary council? Um, I was, I was put on probation, I think is the term. I don't, um, I don't, I think I can't remember exactly, but for okay, not, not excommunicated, not, right. not disfellowship. Right. Okay. For a period of time. And, um, and I wasn't able to give talks, uh, pray, <laughs> um, anything like that in church, which, which was hard because, you know, if you've ever done something, you don't want people to know about it. You'd rather keep it a secret. And so, but by nature, because of that, it, it makes it more apparent, right? Because someone comes up to you in church and says, Hey, can you give the closing prayer? <laughs> and you say, oh, actually, I, I can't or, or something, right? I'll be working that day. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'll be visiting my family. Sorry, can't yeah. make it. Um, and, uh, and so, and so it, was, it was tough. It, w- it was humbling. I would say of anything else, it was humbling. But going through the process personally, um, I'm grateful that, that, I, that I had to go through that process. And Why is that? Um, you know, I think that, um, there's this innate, I, 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 I'm, I think I'm like most people. I, I, I try to justify things, right? So I had tried to justify my behavior for so long. And, and when I knew what, what I was doing was wrong and, and so you try to justify what you've done and, and make it seem less, less, uh, less important than what it was. And that the gravity isn't as great as, as, as maybe you, as maybe some might say. And, um, it helped you to be realistic about what happened and the gravity yeah, of it. It, 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 it helped me understand how important the commandments are the commandments that have been given to us by our heavenly father and Jesus Christ, they they've come from them and they truly are not a burden, but a protection for us. And it helped me understand that what I had done was, was severe, was wrong and that I needed the atonement and, and going through the process, um, really helped me understand the atonement help, help, help me change, help me make the right steps instead of just doing what I had previously wanted to do, which was sidestep it. Just say, oops, I made a mistake. Don't need to go to my bishop. Don't need to talk to anybody. I'll just sidestep it. I think that that kind of elevates the status of the commandments and, and helps illustrate how important they are. Right. And it would have cheapened the, totally. you know, the, the gospel to say that you don't really have to do anything. Totally. You know, once you've, you've gone down this road to get back on the right path. Yeah, absolutely. And, and help me understand how important it was to live by those, by, by, by the commandments. And that they're there for a reason, truly. And, and I think that I would have, it would have been easier to go back and commit that sin again, had I not gone through that process. Hmm. Because... Because you don't understand the gravity of it, which it is. It is. It is. They're there for a reason. They're they're not just pulled out of thin air, right? And so and so for me, it was. I was nervous going in. I was humbled through the, through through the entire process, but I felt nothing but love and support from the leaders who were helping me through it. Who, and I think the key is sincerity right i was i was there with a sincere desire to change they could feel that they knew that and so they were they were trying to help me reach my my goal which is to become clean to use the atonement to repent to to um utilize the atonement and to become uh temple worthy again right and so so anyway it was a it was a process i had to go i mean there was you know i went through a period of time uh, where I couldn't, I couldn't do any of those things. And then, uh, and then I, I would meet with the bishop, uh, with my bishop during that process. And we would, you know, we would kind of do, we, he would, he would see how I was doing. He'd give me more direction. 
and then and then I reached a point where I think I met back with the council I'd met with before, um, and they and they and and they discuss you know how 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 far I've come and et cetera, and then and then the, um, they they gave me they gave me my temple recommend back and and <clears throat> through that process they um, to this point I hadn't told my I hadn't told anyone in my family besides my cousin who knew they encouraged me to tell my mom and I was resistant to this I didn't <laughs> I didn't want to because I I was ashamed I was ashamed of admitting to to the wrongs I had made. And, um, and so that, that was one of the hardest things I did, but they thought that it would be, it would be good for me because they, they, they thought that my mom would be a great support for me through that process. And she was, I told her and she was everything that you would expect a mom to be. She was loving and supportive and non-judgmental and was a great support to me. And so, and so, um, once I got my temple recommend back, I went with my mom uh, back to the temple for the first time, and um, and it was it was a very special experience because I hadn't been in the temple for a really long time, and uh, <clears throat> and I just fell and felt I felt the spirit so strong, and I just I just felt such peace and comfort, and I knew that I was where I needed to be, and. And, and I resolved to never do anything that would make me unworthy to enter the house of the Lord again. And, and, uh, so it was, uh, it was a long journey and it was hard and it was humbling, but it was worth it. And, and I'm grateful. Um, I'm grateful for the lessons that I learned, although I wish I hadn't have gone through them (laughs) in the first place. Why is that? Um, I mean, like that scripture, you know, blessed are, um, I'm not gonna be able to quote it precisely, but blessed are those who believe without seeing. Uh, and, and, uh, um, I, I would, uh, I'm stubborn. I've said that already, but I kind of have to learn things for myself and I wish that I would be smart enough or I would have been smart enough to learn from other, from others mistakes. Uh, and I think the scriptures are, are a great tool for that. And as I, as I've come to understand that the scriptures are chock full of people who have lived a li- lived their lives, been down this path and they, and it's full of words of wisdom of don't go here. Don't do this. It doesn't bring happiness. It, it isn't the way to go. Instead, follow the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Live, live live according to these commandments and you will be happy. And I wish that I could have learned from other people's mistakes without having made my own. And I look at my friends who have done that and I think it's awesome. And, and, and they are, and I am envious to some degree that I wasn't able to do that because I had to go through pain that I wouldn't have otherwise. But, um, but, uh, but you know, I, I guess, I didn't, so here I am. Glad, glad you're here now. And you know the, the scripture you quote in your Facebook post is therefore blessed are they who humble themselves without being compelled to be humble. Yeah, there you go. And Alma thirty two <laughs> verse sixteen. Yeah. And so you've learned a lot going through this process. Yeah. And um, you know, and that's the important thing at this point. And um, you, you talk about eighteen lessons learned yeah. from this. Um, the first, you said, cynicism creates a numbness toward life. What did you mean by that? Um, that uh, being cynical in nature brings nothing but uh, negativity. It's, it's not productive. I, I also mentioned in there, I, I mean, being, having a healthy dose of skepticism, I feel, is important in anything in life. It's it's good to question. We're taught to question in the church to s- search for answers, to pray, to search, search. diligently. Yeah, right. Yeah. Being be, ask and you shall receive. Yeah, yeah. That's that's healthy. That's good. But being skeptical, uh, 
or, or, or cynical. Cynical. Yeah. Being cynical an ex- is an extreme skepticism, maybe. Yeah, or, it's or, or skepticism coupled with doubt. Yeah, and it's it's uh, it's always looking for it's looking for the bad and not accepting the good, right? It's it it's it's categorized by by that by those people that I mentioned earlier who <clears throat> who despite despite everything the church does that is good, they're unable to acknowledge any of it and can only find fault, can only, you know, life, I mean, you can find fault in anything and anyone in this world because we're all imperfect. And, and to live your life that way is, is fruitless. It's, 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 um, it's, it's a horrible path. And so anyway, I would, I would avoid against it. <laughs> You said lesson two, we are not alone. And uh, what, what did you mean by that? That God does exist. I mean, I, I went through a period where I didn't believe in God anymore. I, um, I wasn't sure if he existed. And, and as, I, as I said earlier, <clears throat> I've had experiences where, I, where I, I felt God's love and I cannot deny that I have felt his, his presence. And... You are not alone. We are not alone within this world. <clears throat> there are bad things that happen in this world every day, and there are bad people, but that does not discredit God. And we know from the plan of salvation that that's part of the plan. We, we were never meant to come down here and for everything to be perfect. There, we all have our free agency, and because of that, people choose to make wrong decisions. Sometimes those de- decisions impact you. Sometimes there's natural disasters, which God allows to happen for reasons that maybe we don't understand now, but God is there and he loves you and you are never alone. You can always turn to him. Lesson three, instant gratification is counterfeit happiness. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, that is, that line sums it up. It, it, it truly is counterfeit happiness. Um, it doesn't bring long-term happiness. Uh, living according to the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ is what brings long-term lasting happiness and is, is the way to a fulfilling life, the most fulfilling life. And, uh, and that's been, you know, that's been um, shown time and time again in the scriptures. And, and I felt that in my own life. I know that I am happiest when I, align my life and myself to the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That seems to go along with lesson four. You said commandments and laws and rules help you learn. Yeah. Uh, there's this, you know, there's this idea that some people have that they're restrictive. That why are you, why are you restricting yourself with all these rules and commandments and laws? And, and uh, I found the opposite to be true. I found that they provide protection and, and guidance and a guardrail as you know is a is a common example they really do they provide guidance and in the long run give you more freedom give you more opportunity because they keep you from uh experiencing hardship and things that you wouldn't otherwise so those things are meant to help and protect us and uh as you follow them you will be happier in lesson five you are not the exception to the rule. Yeah. What did you mean by that? I thought I was. I think a lot of people do. You always think that... That goes back, I guess, to the pride aspect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You think, uh, oh, I'm not going to... I can I can do this and it's not going to impact me the way that it has others. I can suspend the laws of the universe. <laughs> right. Okay. Exactly. You're not the exception to the rule. Uh, you weren't the first to come down this path. And, you know, laws are laws. Uh I think I, I quote in there, but I, I love this quote. You cannot, uh, you cannot break the law. You can only break yourself against the law. Lesson six, it's the daily little decisions in life that determine your destiny. Yeah, the, insignificantly, the seemingly insignificant small decisions in life make the world of difference, right? It's the little things. And you can apply this to every aspect of life. Um, uh, it's, it's the, it's the little decisions you make daily that are going to determine your happiness. And that applies to your spirituality as well. It's the little things that build up over time. It's these small, these small decisions that, that build 
your life is essentially a conglomerate of all your small daily decisions. So what, where are those small decisions leading you? Yeah, in your case, it was the small things, the praying, the reading the scriptures, the attending church that, that started your drift out of the church. And it was the yeah. small things that started the rekindling of the flame of your testimony. Yeah, uh-huh, absolutely. Lesson seven, you can be guilt-free and clean of your past mistakes. Yeah, um, the atonement is real, the Savior is real. That's, that's what this message is about, right? That, that there is no one who came to this earth who is perfect except Jesus Christ. But that through him, through his atonement, he has paid the price for you to repent and become clean and, and return to your heavenly father. And there's hope in that. There's hope despite what you've gone through, despite what you've done, despite where you are. It's not, it's not where you've been. It's not, it's, not where, it's not where you've been. It's where you're going, right? And, and the atonement and the savior give you the opportunity to achieve uh, your greatest potential. In lesson eight, you said, surprise, everyone who goes to church is not yet perfect. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've heard this a lot from people who they have a bad experience with someone who went to church. I have, I have close family members who um, I think their leaving the church was precipitated at a young age by experiences they had with people, peers at church who maybe treated them poorly or something of that, of that nature. I think if you haven't had something like that happen to you at church, you're probably the exception. I think a lot of us have experienced um, people at church who, who, who aren't perfect and that's okay because we're all imperfect. Right. And, and uh, every single religion and organization on the earth has bad people in it. That's just the reality. And uh, are there people who go to church who do bad things outside of church? Yes. But in my experience, they are the exception, not the rule. The, major- the, the majority of people who are going to church are, are trying to be better. And don't be offended when you come across someone who isn't perfect because that's, that's just life. Go to church. Instead, your focus should be to... Uh, to to go to church, to learn the doctrine, to serve others, and and instead turn that around. And if you find someone that is who is behaving poorly or who treats you badly, see that as an opportunity to serve them and help them come closer to Christ. Because obviously, those are the people that need it the most, right? So, lesson nine: it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Yeah, that's a quote from Aristotle, which I love. And um, I don't know if I uh, give him credit there, but I should have if I didn't. And uh, I've, I've come to understand that um, there are, I have, I have lots of friends and family members who, who don't believe what I believe. Um, and that's okay. We can, we can live in harmony and we can, we can accept we can accept each other's differences and not be hypercritical of each other. And, um, and I found that those who are closed minded, uh, often don't, often don't allow themselves to truly understand what that other person is believing, whether it's a, whether it's a belief in, in a church or something else. And so whether it's Mormonism, I mean, there's, there's a number of people out there who, you know, think that that uh, Mormons are crazy because we believe these crazy things, and they don't allow themselves to entertain the thought of where we're coming from. And likewise, outside the Mormon Church, there's you know there's people that maybe I don't understand, but I need to put myself in their shoes. I need to open my mind to understand understand what they're believing. It doesn't mean I have to believe it, and that's okay. I can. I can try to come to an understanding of somebody else without having to accept their beliefs. And so, so my hope is that we can all do that with each other and have a greater understanding amongst us. You said in lesson 10, you get as much out of something as you put in. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's just a great life lesson, right? That you're only going to get out 
of something as much as you put in, whether that's school or church or going to the gym or anything, anything in life, if you go in with a bad attitude, if you, if you're going to church specifically, if we're talking about church, if you go to church (laughs) and you're not participating, you're probably not paying attention or half paying attention or you're on your cell phone or you're on Facebook or whatever, you're obviously not going to get much out of it. And so I know so many people who, who say that they don't get anything out of church or church is, you know, boring or whatever. And yet they're not putting in very much of an effort. You're, you can only expect to get out what you're willing to put in. And so, so don't, don't discredit something unless you've given it your full effort and not just for a day, you know, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to try. You're not going to get an education in college by going for a day or a week or a month and saying, well, I tried, but it didn't work out for me. You've got to put in the time. And if you want to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ and feel the spirit, you've got to do your part. You've got to go in. You've got to try. You've got to, you've, you've got to participate. You can't just go through the motions. Going through the motions, riding the fence isn't going to lead you to the place you need to be. Yeah, it's like, I guess, maybe, you know, putting gas in the gas tank of your testimony's engine, you know, that you know, if you're not praying, you're not reading the scriptures, you're not attending church, that your engine's going to run out. Yeah. And, um, you know, at some point, you're going to be saying, well, you know, this this, this car doesn't work. And, yeah. And it's because you haven't been fueling it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You said Lesson 11, the Book of Mormon will help you come unto Christ. Yeah, as I, as I mentioned earlier... Um, I've, I've read um, the Old Testament, New Testament, uh, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, my entire life. I've read all, all the standard works, and they're all amazing. They're all great, but there's something powerful about the Book of Mormon. Um, if you haven't read it, or you've read it superficially, or, or you think you know what it's about, and you have a desire to come unto Christ... It works miracles. It truly does. And I know in my life that, that that book, more than any other book, has helped me understand Christ and his teachings more than any other. There's a power that comes from reading it. And I've personally never come across uh, someone in life who has read the book sincerely and given it a chance and can say, that's a bad book. I just, I, I, I don't know of that person because... If you are an intelligent and reasonable person, you can't read that book from beginning to end and come away with that conclusion. So, Lesson 12, weird is a relative term, and often things are only weird to us when we don't understand them. Yeah, I, I bring that up because um, for those who aren't familiar with the uh, LDS faith, um, you know, we're oftentimes perceived as weird still, even... Even today, there's lots of people who have misconceptions about us, but it's, it's, uh, and I think the church, even within the last year, um, coming out with that video that they did on the temple garments, um, are helping to shine light on some of these things that people find weird. And oftentimes when you, when you explain them, uh, in an understandable way, people go, oh, I, that makes sense. I understand that. Um, I, I, I would explain the temple garment very similarly to how the church explained it in in the video before before they released the video and every time i would explain it people would say oh that that makes sense to me it's uh you wear it as a as an external reminder of an internal commitment you've made to heavenly father it's meant to remind you of these promises that 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 you've made so that goes for people who don't understand mormonism that goes for 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 us uh maybe as 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 mormons who don't understand other cultures we can all understand each other better if we dig down a little deeper and get get under the superficial layer. Lesson 13, LDS members don't think they're better than everyone. Yeah. Um, uh, I've, I've, I've come across this a little bit where... This almost sounds like it maybe came, came out of your cynical stage, you know, that uh, <laughs> when you're looking for things to criticize that... That's one of the things that you sometimes hear is, you know, oh, you guys think you're better than I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's this idea maybe that uh, I think oftentimes that people within the church are self-righteous. 
and not to say that that doesn't exist. There are people who are self-righteous and um, that exists in every faith. Um, but on the whole, um, members of the, of the LDS faith don't, we don't have a superiority complex. We don't think we're better than everybody else. We don't think that we're the only ones that are going to be saved. That would be illogical because we're out there trying to get everybody to join us, to accept this message because we think that everyone has the same potential as us. We are all equals. We are all brothers and sisters, spiritual brothers and sisters of each other. And our, our hope is that we can help as many people come unto Christ as we feel we have and experience the joy that comes from living the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our objective. It's not, it's not in any way... Uh, because we think we're better or because we think we, we, uh, we're, you know, we, we have, we're entitled to more under any, any capacity. Anyway, we're all on an evil, on an even playing field and, uh, we're just trying to help people maximize their potential and experience the same joy that that we, that we are. Lesson 14, working in the Lord's vineyard is awesome. Yeah, this one, this one was a light bulb moment for me. I, I, I often thought the only reward you get from the only reward you get from living the gospel of Jesus Christ is the end reward, right? Is the uh, after this life we will be blessed with exaltation, with living with God, whatever, right? Um, but in but I've come to understand that I was missing the mark a little on that parable that's in the New Testament of the workers in the Lord's vineyard. And how they they come, the one that comes at the first hour and the one that comes at the sixth hour and the one that comes at the end of the day, they all get paid the same. And they kind of think, what the heck? This isn't fair, right? And I came to realize that there's not just the reward you get at the end, but, but the other reward is the joy that comes from working in the vineyard. And working in the vineyard and the people who came at the first hour even though they got the same reward at the end of the day, they also received little rewards along the way from working in the vineyard, the joy that came from serving. I found personally that serving in the Lord's vineyard, serving others, working, and that joy that I talked about that I started to experience really uh, at 14, about that age, where it really started to click for me, that man, living the gospel of Jesus Christ and serving and working in the Lord's vineyard, that in and of itself is a reward. It's awesome. It's awesome. And so there's this idea of, oh, the people who get to, you know, they just, they don't come to church. They don't have a calling. They, they just, you know, play on Sundays or they stay home. They do what they want. They don't, they don't have to do all these other things that, that I have to do, their life is better. And somehow I'm getting ripped off because I'm having to put in more time. And, but no, that's not the case. I'm happier when I'm serving. I'm happier when I have a calling. I'm happier when I'm able to impact the lives of others. I'm happier when I'm living the gospel of Jesus Christ than I ever was when I wasn't. And so working in the Lord's vineyard, that is reward in and of itself. And then at the end, you also get another reward. I mean, it's like rewards all over the place. Anyway. <laughs> Lesson 15, listen to wise advice and learn from others. Yeah. Um, so this, this, this was kind of uh, something that I learned the hard way, right? That uh, my parents and my leaders and people who I respected growing up um, and the church leaders gave wise counsel and there was wise counsel within the scriptures and going back to some of the other rules, I, I thought I was wiser than them. I thought I was the exception to the rule that I didn't need to follow that counsel, that I would still be able to experience the same joy. And what I found was 999 times out of a thousand, I was wrong, uh, that they were right, that their counsel is sound, that, that, uh, that, that the scriptures are inspired, that our leaders, our living prophet and apostles, they're inspired men. And we have inspired men and women in our church leaders who guide us and direct us. 
and that if we will follow them, no, no, they're not perfect. And yes, they will make mistakes, but so would we, if we were in their shoes and the, and following their counsel is the best path to happiness. Lesson 16, don't let what you don't know keep you from following what you do know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I mentioned this in there, but I actually, um, I actually got that from my dad who taught me that principle. Um, he, he, we were talking, uh, he actually came to visit me in Seattle and, and I, um, <clears throat> and he, I didn't open up completely to him as to the uh, degree of my doubt, but in our discussions, I think he discerned some of it. Right. And, uh, and he, he made this comment to me and, 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 and it came back and it kind of triggered in my mind as I started to come, as I started to re- return that, uh, there are, there are questions in life that we may wonder, uh, when did the dinosaurs live on the earth and how does that fit into the creation and the plan of salvation? Well, I don't know. And neither does anybody else. And it's okay. It doesn't matter. Uh, that doesn't impact what I do know and what I have experienced and the, and the spirit that I have felt and the testimony that I have gained and, and all the things that have happened. There are things in this life we will never know. And to wait for answers to every question you have in life, if you have an inquisitive mind like myself, uh, is futile. You will never get there. You will be waiting forever until the world is over and then you'll go, oh, okay. But then I missed out. You missed out on going back to, to that other point of working in the vineyard and experiencing the joy and getting all that joy and happiness and blessings that come from living the gospel of Jesus Christ. So don't get bogged down by these little insignificant things. Don't get stuck in the weeds. Uh, you know, Focus on the things that are important that, that really matter. Lesson 17, listen to your conscience. Yeah, and really this is, you know, listen to the spirit. I mean, uh, the secular world might call it your conscience or your Jiminy Cricket, right, who speaks to you, uh, guides you. But but I believe from experience and and, and know that this this is the Holy Ghost talking to me. And I found in life that, uh, I've, I've really come to understand how the spirit talks to me and it, it is as the scriptures speak, it's still, it's small. It speaks to your mind and your heart and the spirit because of his nature is very quickly, quickly offended by, by evil, by, um, by things that are not worthy of Heavenly Father and the Spirit. And so if you put yourself in situations where the Spirit cannot reside, you are doing yourself a disservice. Listen to those promptings, the small positive impressions that come, that come to your mind. Act on them. The more you act on them, the, the more frequently they come and the stronger the impression comes. When, when, when you feel impressed to... You should, call this, you should call this friend and help them out. You should go serve. Or when you're sitting in church and they say, we need a volunteer to do this. How many of us sit there with our hands by our sides going, oh no, I don't want to raise my hand. I don't want to do it. But the Spirit's probably telling you, hey, you should, you should volunteer. You should do this. President Monson is, a, is one of the greatest examples of this, right? Where he feels prompted to follow what, he is being impressed to do and he does it and he blesses so many lives. And as you do that, as you, you will stay close to the spirit and, and you will stay on the path and you will be a great force for good working in the vineyard. In lesson 18, I want to share my happiness with others. Yeah. Having gone through this experience and really why I decided to write this, I, I mentioned a little bit at the beginning of the piece I wrote, um, I, I didn't want to put this out there because I didn't want to admit that I had gone, that I had made mistakes, right? No one does. And, um, I wrote it and I literally sat on it for about four months. And every once in a while, this goes back to the, to lesson 17, I would feel prompted 
to share it, but I would resist because I didn't want to. And I was afraid to, I was afraid of the critics that would, uh, come because they always come. I was afraid of, uh, I was afraid of putting myself out there, but ultimately I decided that my experience, um, maybe, maybe my experience could help somebody else. And the joy that I felt coming back is so great that I, I, my hope is that others can have the same experience. If they have gone through a period of doubt or are going through a period of doubt and have left, um, that they will be impressed to give it another try, to start to do those small things. I'm not, again, I don't think that I'm smarter than anybody else. I don't think that I, that I am superior to anybody else, but I have felt this joy and I want people to experience the same joy. I think that's natural. And, um, and so my hope is that I can help others experience that joy. Well, it, it's a really important story. I think that you have, there's a lot for us to learn. And um, I, I wanna thank you for sharing your story and sharing the lessons that you've learned from that with others. Thank you. Th- thanks for the opportunity to do so. Appreciate it. If you like this podcast, you can help promote it by rating it in iTunes and by writing a review. Post a link to it on your blog or Facebook page and tell your friends about us. Questions or comments about this episode can be sent to podcast at fairlds.org or join the conversation at Fair Mormon Blog. Music for this episode was provided courtesy of Paul Cardall. The opinions expressed in this episode are not necessarily the views of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or of Fair Mormon.